Well, good morning, good morning and welcome to our Cosmic Conversations here on the uh, Morrison Planetarium Facebook page as well as the Open Space YouTube page. Uh, my name is Ryan White. I'm the director of Morrison Planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And uh, I, it's a great pleasure to be talking today with Ed Liu, uh, former NASA astronaut, former Google uh, guru, and now uh, executive director of the Asteroid Institute at the B612 Foundation. So welcome, Ed. All right, it's always good to chat with you. Yes, normally we have the pleasure of talking in the dome and being able to <laughs> invite people into the giant immersive space of more. That's one of my favorite places, the dome there. But but uh, yeah, luckily we still have some Soon. of the same Soon. tools today. So yeah, I thought it would be great to talk a little bit about asteroids and uh, how you got into it. And of course, uh, we have our kind of chat lines open all the time. So if you have any questions for uh, Ed, please feel free to put them in the Facebook or YouTube chat, uh, and we'll get to those in the course of the program. But I guess, you know, have you as you've made this pivot to, to become, uh, to sort of worry about asteroids so the rest of us don't have to, or at least don't have to as much, you be what, is, what inspired you to make that kind of career change? Well, um, it's something I've always been interested in, you know, back actually actually started when I was a kid because I was interested in dinosaurs like all kids, right? Space and dinosaurs. And I had my favorite book, which was a, it was called The How and Why Wonder Book of, Astro of, of Dinosaurs. And all, you know, I, I memorized all the different dinosaurs and I got to the last page and then it says, and then the dinosaurs died and we have no idea why. And that was it. <laughs> Right. And I remember, you know, being satisfied yeah. with that explanation. And, you know, many, you know, fast forward many years later, I'm in grad school and this crazy theory came out from uh, Louis Alvarez and his son that an asteroid killed off the dinosaurs. And I remember thinking about thinking, how could that be? You know, you know, it's too right. small. You know, the Earth is, you know, 8000 miles across. And, you know, you're talking about something, you know, a few, you know, maybe 10 miles across. How is that going to kill everything on planet Earth? What about the stuff, things on the other side? And I remember having an argument with my office mate, um, Russ Hamilton, and another one of the grad students. And we were in my office and we were going, well, let's let you work out the numbers here. You know? So, we, you know, if you look at the actual energy of a 10 mile asteroid hitting the Earth, you know, you come up with sort of, you know, tens of billions of hydrogen bombs. And you go, oh, all right. OK, I get it. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, OK. Wow. Well, that's more than enough <laughs> energy, at least. Yeah, I remember that epiphany too, where it was like, wow, if you just convert the kinetic energy of, of an asteroid to heat, then wow, it's a lot yeah, of heat. It's a lot of energy. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, people talk about, you know, um, nuclear winter, and this is like a thousand times worse. Yeah. Or 10,000 times worse. So this is, this was 100,000 times worse. So, um, okay. All right. So that's bad. Um, but what about the crater? There's no crater from this thing. You would expect right. a crater with this. And I remember the day when someone came into our, you know, one of the other grad students comes running to our office and goes and said they found the crater. And it was under the uh, the Gulf of Mexico. It was right. discovered because the Mexican oil company was doing uh, seismic surveys, looking for oil underneath the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and they found this enormous <laughs> circular feature, which was very round, had the central peak, and it was a crater. And that was it. That turned out to be it. And so in my back, my mind was always this like, wow, you know, we, we ought to do something about that someday. And I went about my business, got my degree, you know, worked as a scientist, went to NASA. But always in the back, of my, you know, my mind was this, you know, what would we do about that? And then around this time, we were beginning to develop uh, new engines and we were uh, beginning to be able to actually track asteroids much better. Uh, it's a difficult problem, but the around that time uh, was the impact of the uh, comet on Jupiter. Right. And um, that really got us thinking about it. And that's when Congress told NASA to go find at least the, the asteroids that were large enough. So if they hit the earth, that's the end of human civilization. Right. Seems like a good thing. Um, and so that got funded. And then me and others started thinking about, well, what in the world would we do if we found one? And then we started right. looking at the, the the engines available, the, our ability to launch things, you know, our ability, how well we can track things, and we sort of realized, hey, you know what? It's 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 actually quite possible for us to deflect something, and and it's actually not that hard. 
So we, we hosted a meeting at the Johnson Space Center and um, brought in a bunch of people, uh, um, asteroid experts, and we sort of discussed, like, how would we deflect an asteroid? We sort of all realized that by the end of a weekend-long meeting, we all realized, you know, hey, this is possible. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the discovery of asteroids continues along. Right. And, um, you know, that's how that's how our B6 Stealth Foundation got started. And that, you know, I've been working on it ever since. Well, maybe that's a good cue to kind of be able to talk about the magnitude of the of the challenge uh, to bring up some of our, our open space software and kind of show um, um, out in, in honor of your uh, uh, history as an NASA astronaut. I'll go ahead and just uh, start. My, that's my old office building. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it has no permanent address. It just continually moves. Right. And uh, it's, uh, it kind of looks like it's plummeting into the ocean there, but we're just pulling away from Earth. Uh, uh -huh. But um, we do have locations of, and let me go ahead and bring up some uh, orbit lines for um, uh, for Earth to give a little context here, and you can begin to see the orbits of uh, uh, Earth and the other planets around the sun here. And then uh, one great thing about open space is we do have kind of different categories of asteroids, uh, and so I think you know when most people think of asteroids, uh, you know they think of of uh, the main belt, and we actually divide that into a couple different, um, oops, sorry, I'm kind of slowing ourselves down here. Um, there's a lot of asteroids. That's there's a lot of asteroids. That would be the punchline <laughs> right away. Um, and uh, and this is, uh, and unfortunately, I guess, because I because uh, we've got so many here, I, it's a little hard to show them in um, uh, uh, evolving over time. But let me go ahead and actually uh, take out our, our really crowded field here. Actually, that's highlighting some of the inner ones. Um, but maybe focus now on the on the um, what we call the potentially hazardous asteroids. Actually, here we're highlighting, sorry, in the kind of purplish color is the outer main belt, the yellowish color is the inner main belt. And uh, I apologize since my uh, computer was a little overloaded, we uh, um, uh, had a little lag time there. So let me just focus on on these potentially hazardous asteroids and, and kind of maybe you can describe how we search for these. Yeah, so the, the, the as uh, Ryan just mentioned, the, the big donut of green asteroids, that's the main belt. Those are, most, those are the asteroids between Mars and, and Jupiter. And occasionally some asteroids in that belt, and there are millions of them, uh, come close to, to Jupiter or they end up um, sort of getting kicked a little bit by, you know, they get into a orbit that is resonant with Jupiter and and they pick up or um, you know a pretty good change in velocity and that makes them shift out of their orbit from between Mars and Jupiter into orbits that actually enter the inner solar system and go near near where Earth is so Earth as you all know is interior to Mars um, and uh, oh that stopped. I just, I, just um, I, I hit the wrong button here and I think that my Overloading the system earlier didn't help, but let me go ahead and restart if you could keep. Okay, so, so these asteroids end up coming fairly close to Earth. They enter sort of Earth's neighborhood in the solar system, which is, you know, between Venus and Mars. And so they they still are orbiting the sun in, in orbits that we can predict and calculate and so on. But um, because they, they cross Earth's orbit, they have a chance of hitting the Earth, that means. You know, an asteroid in the asteroid belt has no chance of hitting the Earth as long as it stays in the asteroid belt because the Earth's not there. You know, remember that you can think of these as sort of raceway tracks around the sun. And if, if as long as they stay in their lane out there in the uh, asteroid belt, they're good. They're not bothering anybody. But some of them go off the road, off the, uh, you know, the beaten track and end up on these other tracks that, that take them past Earth. And what we do to find them remember that you can't keep an asteroid from hitting the earth unless you know ahead of time that it's going to hit the earth um these what we do is we use telescopes when we look out and what we actually do is we we see an asteroid we see it multiple times and we we draw a line and we calculate the trajectory you know between the different observations line is curved because it's going around the sun and, and you can actually calculate that trajectory 
And then what you do is you run the clock forward. You calculate where is that trajectory going to go over the next decades, uh, several decades, and say, well, is it ever going to come close to the Earth? Because I know where the Earth is going. And so there's a lot of math involved here. But that process is one where we uh, can rule out asteroids as being dangerous or not. In general, we're not really looking for an asteroid. Uh, you know, this is one of the misconceptions that many people have, that you're thinking about asteroids as being, uh, I'm going to catch them just before they hit the Earth, and I'm going to somehow or other stop it. That's not what's going to happen. What, what I'm actually going to do is we're actually going to calculate the orbit, which is then going to go around the sun many, many times. And over decades of time, the Earth and that asteroid have an appointment. You know, and that is, those are the ones we can prevent from hitting the Earth. And that's actually what our goal is. What I'm trying to do here, and, and this is just the relative sort of handful of, uh, of asteroids, as you mentioned, the bulk of them being farther from the sun, that, that are in these kind of potentially hazardous Earth-crossing orbits. A beautiful visualization. Yeah, and the uh, so the trails kind of show kind of the direction they're heading, and I'm I'm speeding up time a little bit to show their their movement around the sun. But like you said, then this is the challenge. Then is is locating them, figuring out that trajectory, and, and how many observations does it take to really be able to pinpoint things? Like like I, we've been hearing a little bit about Apophis, which was mm -hmm. kind of the horror story from a few years ago that it could be uh, impacting Earth in in the late twenty twenties or twenty thirties. But and now there's a uh, interest in, in creating a more precise trajectory or understanding of its trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. The minimum number of observations it takes is three, but that gives you, in general, a very, very imprecise orbit one that's really not of much use for saying, is that going to hit the earth or not? Uh, so, in general, the more the better, because what I'm going to end up doing is trying to fit an orbit line that goes through all those observations. The more observations I have, the more constraints I have on, on how much I can shift that orbit around. And uh, in general, for us to get a pretty good observation, you end up with many tens of observations, tens or even hundreds or thousands of observations. And, uh, you know, so the cases for Apophis, this, this asteroid, which we do know is coming very close to the Earth in both 2029 and 2036, um, is in fact, has been observed hundreds of times, including using radar which allows us to not only tell where on the sky it is, but the distance. And using all of that information, we actually have a very good uh, orbit for the asteroid Apophis. Well, and we're kind of showing all of these as, as just their trajectories, but these are kind of unique individuals too. And yeah, they're their own little worlds, if you'd like. They're, yeah. You know, and then it's, it's a little world. And, and some are... Um, Maybe more like rubble piles. Some are more solid. So, so, and and of course, most are much smaller than the the dinosaur killer that uh, that uh, uh, created such a problem for for some of our ancestors. So, uh, how much is uh, effort needs to be put into characterizing the asteroids as well? Well, well, for a lot of reasons, we want to characterize them, both from the scientific standpoint, telling us about the origins and evolution of the solar system, the chemical evolution of the solar system, the the geology, if you'd like, in the solar system. Um, obviously, you want to find out what they're made of, or individual ones are made of, if any one of them has a chance of hitting the Earth, because that tells you about which deflection methods are, are most effective. Right. Um, or also, you know, how dangerous that is, because, for instance, if an asteroid is solid iron, it's a lot more massive than one if it's a loosely held, held together pile of rock because iron is quite dense. Um, so th there's a lot of reasons to want to know that. Um, yeah, I, I always find it fascinating just looking at these images of these things, thinking that each of these things is an individual little world. You know, they're rotating. They have days and night cycles. Right. Some bigger, some smaller, all different sizes. There's a myriad of worlds in our solar system, and a, only a very small fraction of them are actually tracked. You know, what we're seeing here looks like a lot. But it's actually a small fraction of what's out there. And uh, that's our challenge right now, because until you know where they all are, you don't know what the risks are to planet Earth. And then, so the Asteroid Institute is uh, the research group that you head up. What kind of work are you involved with to, uh, to move all of this forward? 
Well, we are primarily interested in understanding and calculating in, um, the orbits. Now, what's the, the reason it's so important right now is because, remember I mentioned that m the majority of these asteroids are currently undiscovered. You know, roughly, you know, of the ones that I would call significant sized, um, we've, we've tracked about 1% of them. So what's going to change in the next few years is the opening of the world's largest survey telescope called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST, also goes by the name of the Vera Rubin Observatory, named after a famous astronomer, Vera Rubin, passed away a few years ago. Uh, it is supported by the National Science Foundation and is being built in on a mountaintop in Chile. It's opening uh, its dome in about two years, and it will be tracking about 20 times more asteroids than all other telescopes combined up until that point. Wow. We actually do have a little video clip that shows oh, our yeah. recreation. This is our um, our recreation of the building of the telescope that we created for our most recent planetarium show. But oh, it's nice. yeah, these are, kind these of, are, uh, look at the little trucks there to get a sense of scale. Sorry. I want to go down and visit this thing, but uh, you know, hopefully, but hopefully, travel restrictions will open up. And uh, but the main mirror is already in. That dome is built actually. Yep. They're working on the uh, mechanisms for that. And we are working hard with the LSST project on the data pipeline. All those asteroids, and it will have hundreds of thousands of observations per night that we will be uh, cranking through. And I have to give a shout out to Google here because the computational load of that is quite high. And they have donated the compute cycles for us to uh, to, do, to do some of this work. So, yeah, I mean, I think the sheer quantity of data generated by LSST is sort of hard to wrap one's head around. I mean, if you compare it to, I think, heard the comparison, if you had, um, if you went out and bought some hundreds of, of uh, 4K televisions and stacked them up <laughs> side by side, it would be equivalent to the amount of data that's... Uh, it's, it's, about a, it's about a petabyte of data per night. It's amazing. And, you know, a, a terabyte's a big sized hard drive, right? So it's a thousand of those per night. <laughs> so this is definitely a job for a cloud computational system, right? Well, I guess then something else we could uh, could show here, maybe I'll uh, zoom us in a little bit closer to Earth, but is is uh, kind of a sense, because we already mentioned that the, the sort of dinosaur killing asteroids, but of course, we're seeing sort of fireballs and um, uh, less destructive events happening all the time. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons that we chose uh, this date for our conversation is because of an anniversary coming up with the event that occurred in Chelyabinsk. Yeah, Chelyabinsk is a city in Russia, which on, um, this was 2013, so eight years ago, uh, tomorrow night, um, a small asteroid, only 20 meters across, the size of a building, uh, entered the Earth's atmosphere, grazed above the city, and exploded on its way out of town, literally. Um, Next, actually, this is another one we have a video for, so maybe we oh, can yeah, play that. I'd like to say it's the size of Morrison Planetarium. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Unmute myself. If we could, so we like to point out that this is um, about the size of Morrison Planetarium. This uh, 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 thing in the atmosphere. It's a very fast-moving Morrison Planetarium. Yeah, very fast. <laughs> and uh, and I think what's interesting too is that this kind of came in and grazed the atmosphere and could have been much more destructive if it had. Uh, had entered at a steeper angle, right? Yes, it was very lucky for the citizens of Chelyabinsk that it was not headed towards the city, but it's heading over the top of it. And because most of the shockwave did not hit the city, those parts of it sure that did yeah. still caused a lot of damage though. Hundreds of thousands right. of windows were broken. And we'll actually show those locations of uh, where damage was reported here as these little circles appearing on the surface. Yeah, something like 1,500 people ended up in the hospital. Well, it's kind of interesting, too, because there was this right flash, uh, and then people ran to the window to take a look, right? Which is a, well, which was a mistake. Well, and, and because most people's 
knowledge of the geography of Siberia is not great. We we did actually show that relative to New York, San Francisco, and Tokyo, kind of the scale of this damage. So, so imagining what it would be like if uh, if a similar event had taken place over um, sort of over San Francisco is is a little um, uh, is a little daunting. Sorry. Yeah, and this was a pretty small asteroid. I got to remind you that this is only sort of 19 meters across, and uh, we know that size pretty well. Um, but these types of things hit Earth. You know, with this, the explosive energy of this was about a half a megaton. It's about 30 or so times larger than the the bomb dropped over Hiroshima. 30 times larger. Yeah, and these things sort of things hit the Earth every several decades. You know, most of the Earth is, you know, when you look at these images, water, unpopulated forest, right. a lot of people, but not all of it, and less and less so. And, um, you know, th th these things do happen. And then, interestingly, uh, as I recall, the one of the ways that we've identified the sheer number of these events is actually using data that was originally intended to, to uh, detect you mentioned Hiroshima, but to detect um, air bursts from from nuclear explosions. <laughs> yeah, actually, we do have a monitoring system um, for the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which is a treaty signed by most every nuclear country, not all, um, right. that we will not test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And to monitor that, we have these giant listening stations all around the globe. And it turns out that a nuclear weapon going off is actually quite loud. And you can hear it from many, many thousands of miles away. And if you put enough of these stations up, you can actually pinpoint the location of anything by triangulating. And so we have, this, we have this network up and running. We've had it up for decades now. And it's never actually detected an actual nuclear test in the atmosphere because there have been none. But it gets set off every couple of weeks, every couple, you know, actually, probably multiple times a week, it gets set off. And all of those are asteroids blown up in the atmosphere. What? Of various sizes. It can detect fairly small ones. You know, right. Size, size of, uh, you know, like a minivan kind of thing. Um, so not dangerous to people, but it can detect them. But it detected this Chelyabinsk one, you know, certainly was dangerous if it, if it had come closer to the city. And in terms of sort of making the connection between um, asteroids that were we observed, because I mean, certainly one of the challenges, although we've sent a few spacecraft to actually explore asteroids, and as we mentioned, they're, they're each sort of unique individuals in their own right. Um, one of the best ways to understand how, uh, what, we, what we're seeing out there corresponds to reality is, is to collect uh, meteorites that, uh, that we can connect to a, to a specific asteroid. And we now have a few examples of those, right? Yeah, I mean, the, there's quite a collection of people around the world who do collect meteorites, and a lot of scientists who study them. And, and, and from this, we actually know quite a lot about the chemical con composition of asteroids, which we can then in turn uh, use to understand, you know, uh, what, how, how the, how the solar system formed because what it's showing us is the where the heavy elements ended up where the iron ended up where the carbon ended up where all these things ended up in the disk of things that eventually became planets and uh so we actually have it you know a, there's, there's a we have a we know a lot about asteroids from picking up meteorites we don't know as much from having visited them when they're still out there at, you know going around the sun that's changing now because of a couple of really interesting missions. Um, a Japanese mission, which uh, there's two Japanese missions that have brought samples back. One which just landed three months ago. One which uh, is uh, a U.S. mission called Osiris Rex, which is going to be on its way back with its samples. It's already picked up the samples. Uh, so that will be coming back towards Earth. And so we'll get pristine samples, ones that didn't have to get come through the, you know, get blazing hot on their way through the atmosphere and then land in the desert and get picked up by a human being with dirty hands, right? So, right. <laughs> um, you know, so I know, I know there's a lot of scientists really excited about seeing these samples coming in. 
So has anything we've learned about um, from those missions, I think Ryugu and Bennu are two of the asteroids that have been visited recently. Um, has any of that sort of changed some of the, the mitigation strategies or the, the deflection strategies that you've- Yeah, one of the things that, that's becoming clear is that you, you have to be careful about um, you know, operating on these things because many of them are not single large you know, objects that are held together well. You can right. think of them as piles of rocks all sort of loosely held together. They call them rubble piles. And that means that you can't land very well and attach. And you got to be careful of hitting it too hard because you can actually disrupt it. Large enough ones, you know, you can hit reasonably hard, but you can't. You just have to be, think about disruption of these things, and, and which could make your problem worse. Because right. pieces go off in sort of randomized directions. And so um, it, it, it's becoming clear that uh, there, you, you, we can't just sort of do anything you want to move these things. And it's not as simple as like attaching a rocket engine to it. Well, Which, uh, I don't know if we have any questions coming through. Um, we've got our producer, uh, Mary, behind the scenes who's uh, filtering some of those and maybe answering some as they come through. Um, well, I should mention that actually this is an interesting mission coming up because even though these things are kind of loose rubble piles, you can still run into them. And if you run into them with something small, you can actually defect something uh, quite successful. So what's exciting is that later this year, we're launching the first test mission to deflect an asteroid on purpose. It's right. called the ARC, the Dual Asteroid Redirect Test. And they've picked an asteroid, which is two asteroids going around each other. And the reason they did that, they're going to hit the smaller one. The reason is that that allows you to precisely measure how much you've deflected it by because that changes the orbits of the two around each other, which is easily measurable. Right. And so uh, that mission is launching, you know, th that deflection here is coming up here, in, or, or at least the launch of that mission is happening here um, less than a year. Very cool. And then, so I guess one question that probably comes to mind for people who've been thinking about asteroids a little bit is, uh, aside from the dinosaur kind of threat kind of thing, is um, is asteroid mining. That was in the news quite a bit a few years ago, um, and we still hear a little bit about it, but what do you think the future of asteroid mining is? Well, someday I, I believe human beings will be living, operating, and you know, throughout the solar system, not just here on planet Earth. I don't think that that day is thousands of years from now. I think it may even be decades to, you know, maybe hundreds of years from now. And uh, I think when we get to that point, as more and more operations happen, the, the resources for that will primarily come from asteroids. So uh, I think we're really looking at decades. And uh, that's actually quite interesting. Um, you know, maybe within the lives of, you know, the kids out there, you know, this, this could be a big part of their life. Yeah. But it's, it's funny, I, as you were saying that, I have to admit, I was thinking about The Expanse, the science fiction show. Mm -hmm. and, and great great show, by the way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so we could go off on that. But then the question came through, do, any uh, any comments on your uh, your best, worst, favorite, least favorite asteroid movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in terms of ridiculousness, Armageddon is up there at the top. It's kind of hard to beat, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's the one with the oil drillers and so on. But I, I like that one because I'm in it because my first launch um, was used as part, one of the film sequences in it, STS-84, Space Shuttle Atlantis. Um, so uh, I, I think that's kind of cool. But um, uh, I love a lot of space movies. My, my kids, though, do tell me that I'm a pain to watch space movies with because I'm always complaining about the physics in it right. and my daughter's tell, and son tell me to shut up because they're ruining the movie. <laughs> I think actually and, and since we mentioned The Expanse I think uh, on the flip side I think I've been criticized for being like oh wow that's they got that right <laughs> and so it's just as disruptive <laughs> when they get it right like yeah, oh, be quiet I'm trying to watch. <laughs> yeah exactly so um also, our other question uh, here from one of our regular viewers is, as our solar system revolves around the edge of the Milky Way galaxy, is there an increase of potential asteroid collisions as it passes uh, through one of the galaxy's arms? That's an interesting uh, proposition, yes. In fact, 
Um, scientists have been interested in this possibility because there are a lot of uh, objects uh, that are further out even than the asteroid belt. These are right. what become comets when they get thrown out of this the Oort cloud, which is this uh, grouping of you know large objects that are way out beyond Pluto, way way out beyond Pluto. And it turns out that they're just kind of floating out there. They they are in very loose, long orbits around the sun. But if another star comes near us, or you can actually tug something just enough, and if it happens to be tugged in a direction that's headed towards the sun, it will eventually drop in. Right. And so we have noticed that there is, if you look at the historical record of what we have, at least, of large sort of cometary impacts on Earth, there does seem to be a periodicity to that, which turns out to be sort of close to the periodicity of the Earth's moving through the galactic plane. Right, so kind of that that above and below the plane. Yeah, it, yeah. it may be related. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's likely related yeah. to that. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, this is a long scale. We're talking, you know, tens right. of millions of years here. Right. Well, I think it is interesting, though, like with some of the Gaia data, so this the, the satellite the European Space Agency sent up that's doing this very uh, thorough census of, of stars and, and not, not just their locations, but kind of like the asteroid, although without the complexity of asteroid orbits, stars are kind of on trajectories that we can work mm -hmm. backward. We're all moving slowly in our sky. And realizing that well, there have actually been a significant number of near misses between stars in the Gaia data set and the sun, and near misses being like within a light year or, or a few. Yeah, um, well, that's definitely gonna move a bunch of the things in the Oort cloud in or out. So, <laughs> so it's interesting to think, yeah, about uh, about that complexity. Yeah, you could end up with a, you know comets coming in because right. there's just more of them disturbed out there. You know, it's you you you've just like stirred up the hornet's nest. And right. Some... Yeah. Um, I wonder if we have an oh another question from Robin. Uh, what are some of the ways that you would deflect the different types of incoming space rocks? Well, uh, first off, I want to say that it's not really the incoming ones. You're going to catch them when they're out there in deep space, long before they're actually incoming. I mean, their trajectory in the future will take it around towards hitting the Earth. But you catch them and just change, tweak their orbit. That's the way you deflect them. And the easiest way is what we're testing with the DART mission, which is simply to take a small spacecraft, head towards it, and don't apply the brakes before you hit it. <laughs> You just run into it, and, and um, you know the type type of speeds that things are moving in space. You know, several kilometers per second. In this case, it's going to be about six kilometers per second. Uh, it's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, San Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco to San Jose in what about ten <laughs> seconds? Something like that. Beats driving up one hundred one, right? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, you just run into it, and and that amount of momentum shift actually is enough to, to change over a period of years the orbit enough so that, that you can prevent a collision. You can do things in a more controlled manner by doing by hovering spacecraft nearby and, mm -hmm. and for long periods of time it's called a gravitational tractor. I mean if you really, really have a shorter period of time, let's say you know under 10 years and or a very large asteroid, then we do have, we do have nuclear weapons. And what you would do there is not try and break them up, but you actually blow them up near the surface. There's enough heat and radiation that comes off of one of those things that you actually um, vaporize material off the surface. And that actually has a propulsive force. Pretty significant, actually. So uh, basically so giving it a little engine to push it out of the Yeah, way. but you're not really attaching to it. You just put something nearby and you blow it up. Um, that is a possibility. Um, but remember that the number of asteroids decreases greatly the larger you go. So most of the asteroids are the smaller ones. Right. Something like, you know, what we saw in Chelyabinsk or Tunguska. And those are, are the kinds of things you would deflect. You know, they're, they're, they're thousands of times more common. So you might do that a thousand times before you ever need to deploy a nuclear weapon. Right. Think of it that way. At least a thousand times more, more frequently. And um, and those you would use use the run into it method, the, the freeway collision method. They call uh, scientists call it a kinetic impactor. Mm -hmm. 
What about one of the crazier ideas I remember hearing about, which was uh, like go up and paint part of the asteroid white and uh, and allow. Yeah, to I would say that is one of those things that's a very Rube Goldbergish method. You know, it's it's indirect, it's slow, it's right, and also, I would I would say far more technically difficult, right, <laughs> than actually any of the other methods. So you it it has. As far as I can tell, the disadvantage of being more complicated, more expensive, <laughs> less reliable, slower. But other than that, it's a cool idea. So. Well, very good. Well, I don't know if we have any more questions coming through, but uh, oh, here's another one. So how often does an asteroid collide with satellites in orbit? Okay. Not very often because, you know, uh, but uh, Remember that the asteroids come in all sizes, you know, and you can take that size range all the way, all the way down to sand grains and things like that. There's a lot of them out there, and that, those things actually do hit satellites. Um, you know, we've been, we were, uh, we have sent probes through, you know, to Jupiter and so on, and we have had, you know, small, you know, and they're, they're dust grain sized things, but a dust grain moving at, you know, tens of thousands of miles an hour actually is noticeable on your spacecraft. Right. Um, so those those things do happen. Nothing big, though. <laughs> it is it is one of the, the things that, since we've already brought in science fiction movies, it, that when you look at, like, the film Gravity, which had this sort of, like, disaster poured in space, it was just like, but when you think about it, it's like a single meteorite in the wrong place is, a, is, a, is just as, if not more, scary in certain ways. Yeah, yeah. That film was more about man-made debris. Right. Space junk versus, you know, natural... Things, but around planet Earth, we are dominated by space junk. You know, in that tiny little area around the Earth, uh, we are definitely dominated by space junk over, um, you know, my, they call micrometeorites or, or small fragments of, of asteroids. In fact, on my very first flight, uh, the window of our space shuttle was hit by a piece of, they, they believe it was a piece of uh, like a paint fleck or something. I took a took a little chip out of our window, which was worrisome enough that we actually had to downlink a picture because it's on one of the windows. Right. And with the tremendous heat on the front, what you don't want is a crack forming and that thing beginning to burrow its way in. And so, um, yeah, I, I somewhere's in my records here. I, you know, behind me on that shelf back there is a photograph of the thing in our window uh, from from Atlantis on my first flight. I think someone had a question about uh, how dangerous, um, uh, how we're to flip it around, how safe from collisions are the astronauts aboard ISS? Uh, it is the number one safety risk for astronauts, um, according to NASA. If they, when they do their risk assessments, um, the largest probability of people dying in space is collisions with space junk. Wow. And it is due to the fact that most of the debris that can come through the hull of the ISS is too small to be tracked by the Department of Defense, who does the tracking for NASA. So it's the, and again, this is the human-made stuff. Yes, these and are. I guess problematically, more power. likely to be like a, a, a bolt or a nut or something. That's exactly. That's, that's exactly. Like, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fragments of satellites up there. So that is an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, there are commercial companies that are actually beginning to surpass the Department of Defense in their ability to track objects. Wow. And wow. and that will be, I believe, the way in which uh, we secure uh, operations in space through cool. the help of commercial companies. Well, very good. Well, I don't know if we have any more questions. I'll take a quick look down there. Uh, if not, I know we have a few things we can share in our chat. Um, first of all, I think we have some links to more about the B612 Foundation, uh, including your uh, annual report and information that you can find out about all the different things uh, that you do, including actually Asteroid Day. And maybe, I don't know, do you want to say a few words about Asteroid Day before we go? Yeah, that's a, that's a great event. It's a worldwide event um, to sort of bring, uh, to get people to talk about, you know, the interesting things going on with asteroids. It's not just gloom and doom. It's the science. It's the exploration aspects of it and so on. And... Um, I know uh, California Academy of Sciences has been great about uh, partnering on that and holding events. I've been to an event there for Asteroid Day. Um, and um, in fact, these things are held around the world. So to self-organize, kind of like Earth Day. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Asteroids now have their own day too. So and it's June 30th, th mark our calendars. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's on a significant date, June 30th, which is the anniversary of the Tunguska explosion, the sort of the right. largest uh, asteroid impact in the last century or so, uh, which was de utterly destroyed an area roughly the size of metropolitan LA. <laughs> Wild. And uh, yeah, so making Chiliabins look pretty. Uh, Pretty yeah, quite expensive. a bit larger than Chelyabinsk. Yeah. That's for sure. What I should note too that actually, if you um, if you want to watch the the Chelyabinsk video that we showed, we actually do a version of that online, and it's a 360 version. Uh, so even if you're watching on YouTube uh, and and don't have a, a headset, you can still pan around and look at it. But you can uh, re-experience that um, uh, recreation of the Chelyabinsk event uh, on YouTube, and. Uh, since I'm not seeing any, any questions, any closing thoughts before we head out? Yeah, I, I, I can't thank the California Academy of Sciences enough. And Ryan, you and the staff there have been great. And, um, you know, from a partnership standpoint with the B612 Foundation, I think you guys uh, have really helped, you know, you know, tell the message and through especially the, the wonderful visualizations at the planetary. Well, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to hosting you again in the planetarium in the future uh, and talking more about these uh, amazing objects uh, for all of their scientific value and potential value to uh, future space missions, as well as, of course, the potential threat as well. Looking forward to it. I can't wait till it's open and we can all visit. Uh, well, maybe by asteroid day. We'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, again. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Take care. Take care.